Welcome to Dispatches, the official podcast for the Journal of the American Revolution. The Journal of the American Revolution publishes weekly online at www.allthingsliberty.com. For the latest in research, reviews, and commentaries, America's Most Important History is available free of charge at the Journal of the American Revolution. We hope the audience, we feel the audience does, come to the same conclusion that if they were in Arnold's shoes, they would do what he did. That's James Kirby Martin and Tom Mercer, and they're the creators of a new documentary entitled Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed, and they're our guests today. I'm Brady Kreitzer, and this is Dispatches. This episode of Dispatches is sponsored by the new film, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. Available for streaming on Amazon, iTunes, Vudu, and most cable TV providers. For a full listing, visit BenedictArnoldHeroBetrayed.com. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Dispatches. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Today our guests are Tom Mercer and James Kirby Martin, writers and creators of the new documentary, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed. We get to talk about a lot of great articles and books and YouTube videos and all kinds of wonderful little um, analyses of the 18th century on this program. But today is one of the first times we get to interview uh, people intimately involved in the creation of a documentary. James Kirby Martin, of course, has written a number of books uh, on this time period, specifically one of Benedict Arnold. uh, And... He will kind of be the inspiration for this larger narrative that comes out uh, that really seeks to tell the story of Benedict Arnold that isn't really told uh, in the in the popular narrative of the man. He's, of course, America's most famous traitor. At least that's what, um, you know, knowledge on the street tells us. But with the work of Tom Mercer and James Kirby Martin, we see... There's much more gray area involved when studying the life of Benedict Arnold than there is black and white. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our interview with Tom Mercer and James Kirby Martin. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Hey, Brady. Very good to be here. Thanks for having us on the show. Brady, uh, it's very much my pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I think we have a fascinating topic to discuss, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Tell us if you could about your backgrounds. Okay. Well, I've been at this for a long time, uh, more than 50 years, um, teaching at various universities from Rutgers to the University of Houston to uh, one year at West Point. And um, I've written several books, most of them dealing with the American Revolution, uh, some of the titles I think might be uh, familiar, such as A Respectable Army that I did with Mark Lender, and um, uh, some some other books along that line. Most recently, there's a book called Insurrection, and the purpose of that is to try to understand and to uh, get at the realities of the American Revolution. And actually, my most recent book is a World War II novel. I'm sort of taking a little break from the revolution these days, and this is called this book is called Surviving Dresden, uh, and uh, it's doing fairly well in sales, and I've been very pleased with it. And uh, it's another kind of adventure for me to actually get into the uh, business of writing a novel. Well, um, let me start by saying that I grew up in Saratoga in upstate New York, where Benedict Arnold is a bit of a local hero. Uh, Not too many places will say that or admit to it. Um, uh, I studied filmmaking at Ithaca College. Rod Serling was a professor there at the time. But I ended up uh, graduating with a degree in politics instead of filmmaking and um, went on to uh, graduate studies at the Rockefeller uh, uh, College of Public Affairs. And uh, that followed uh, 20 years in government service. And then I felt like I needed a, something more creative in my life. 
and uh, I made a midlife career change into independent filmmaking. Um, <clears throat> my first feature film was uh, a political thriller uh, titled Uncivil Liberties. Uh, it was uh, re originally released on Netflix, uh, then found a home on uh, Amazon Prime Video, and uh, is now looking for a new home, um, even though it's around 10 years old. Uh, but um, uh, this project, uh, Benedict Arnold, Hero Betrayed, is, uh, is really my love interest. James, what first drew your interest into Benedict Arnold as a subject? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, there are a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes I think it really went back to my grade school education because uh, in my generation, we were taught uh, there were two extremes in the revolution. One was the most virtuous George Washington. Uh, you know, he couldn't tell Papa a lie about cutting down the cherry tree and that sort of thing. And then on the other side, there was bad Benedict Arnold uh, who couldn't do any good. Uh, was the essence of all evil and was out from the very start to destroy the American cause. At least that's what I, uh, I learned. Uh, and then that kind of the stereotype stuck with me. And I did some reading uh, in graduate school and be beyond on Arnold's life. And it just didn't add up. The information that I was reading didn't add up. And I'll, I'll talk about that as we uh, go along. And so I really got interested and said, well, maybe somebody ought to try something new instead of repeating over and over and over again what the various Arnold biographies say. Uh, actually go into the archives and do some really serious digging and see what you come up with. And uh, uh, that, that was my challenge. And, and I want to emphasize that I, em that I really began this with an open mind. Uh, I wanted to put all the good, bad stuff in the background and say, okay, how did this guy really live his life as he lived it, rather than, as so many of the biographies did, reliving his life through the prism of treason backward? In other words, I wanted to go from the beginning to the end rather than, than the end to the beginning. Thomas, why did you feel this story would be a good candidate for a docudrama? Well, there's a big untold story to Benedict Arnold's story. Um, the heroic portion of his story is not told and not well understood. And that's the story that takes place in my home region. My home region gets a short shrift when it comes to its contribution to the American Revolution, because to, well, to tell our story is to tell Benedict Arnold's story, and he's been the third rail of American history. Um, so I'm motivated in that uh, sense to, um, to raise up um, my regional contribution to the American Revolution. And uh, Benedict Arnold lends him uh, the heroic years of his career in the Revolution really lend themselves to a big action adventure telling of the story. And that's what we've tried to do while, while maintaining the sincerity and uh, rootedness of a documentary. Uh, what we have is a uh, a cinematic documentary. It's uh, truly a documentary in its content. We've got 13 of the leading historians of the American Revolution in on-camera interviews, uh, but it's really cinematic in its presentation. We wanted to bring these huge land battles of thousands of uh, reenactors and huge naval battles to life and uh, really show Arnold as the action adventure hero that he was during the first three years of the revolution. Tell us about Arnold's early life and upbringing. Well, let me uh, start with that. Um, and to try to understand Arnold, we need to realize there are two Benedict Arnolds in terms of the way his youth is constructed. Uh, one of those ways uh, is through a series of myth-filled tales about this devilish little boy who grew up to be a devilish big boy. And there are all of these, what I call the Benedict Arnold tales that uh, go all the way back to a 19th century historian named Jared Sparks, who wrote the original uh, Arnold biography. It was actually published in the uh, 1830s. 
Uh, and Sparks had been in contact with some of the locals who said that they really knew Arnold when he was a youth. And of course, he was this troublesome little lad and he was driving everyone crazy. And all of these uh, Arnold tales like he liked to during thunderstorms, jump up on tables and yell and scream because that's all part of his devil worship, I guess. And I'm, I'm not going to try to retell all the stories here uh, because there are many of them. Uh, but by and large, there's no evidence to support any of this stuff. It really is made up history and is actually repeated right down to our own time in other many of these stories in other Arnold biographies. Then there's the real Arnold. And there are very, very few documents that are available. One of the most important was uh, he was asked uh, during the war, uh, tell us, tell to, to to explain himself. Well, tell us about what you were like as a kid. Uh, and he, he said to Benjamin Rush, very famous doctor, signer of the Declaration of Independence, he said, well, I was basically a coward until about my 16th birthday. I don't remember whether it's 15 or 16 at this point. But the point is, he didn't describe himself that way. He said, I was kind of a normal kid, you know, shy, quiet guy. Uh, my parents sent me off to school. Uh, they were concerned about uh, disease in the neighborhood, and we'll, we'll get into that as we go along. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that Arnold really didn't have to, uh, didn't, didn't live this child, this life as a child uh, who was sort of warming up to really do bad things during the American Revolution. That's again goes back to the stories are made up to sort of fulfill the prophecy by looking backward, the prophecy of his life by looking backward through treason. Uh, and it's not a very good or effective or honest way to do history. I would uh, say from, from uh, the filmmaker point of view, what we're, what we're showing is um, Arnold is, uh, uh, he's brought up in uh, a church. His mother is very, very religious. And she teaches him about an unforgiving God that is going to take his uh, life without warning. And um, uh, this is a God of arbitrary power. And when his father uh, becomes an alcoholic and the community turns against them and they lose their front pew in the church and, this, uh, uh, and the uh, whole family is dishonored, that uh, Arnold is growing up in an environment where he seeks to restore his honor. He's uh, profoundly dishonored, the family's dishonored. And the thing that is driving him uh, from childhood forward, the formative years of his childhood are this sense of loss of honor and loss of opportunity. Um, he, he had thought he'd be uh, destined for Yale, but instead he uh, ends up an apothecary's apprentice uh, because of the family's misfortune. Um, so, that's what we talk about in the film is uh, bringing uh, it, it, that, that part of his upbringing that drives him to this uh, overwhelming desire to protect his honor, restore his honor. How did Arnold recover and separate himself from really what were his father's failings? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be very brief and, and just say from my point of view and from what we, what we show in the film, he's got a powerful entrepreneurial spirit and uh, he goes into business and he's a very successful businessman. Um, and he's really trying to prove himself that he can be a success and he wants desperately to be accepted into social circles uh, because he is a successful businessman but um, he's not ever fully accepted because of the, the shadow of his background. Jim? Uh, yes, let me add to what Tom has said by pointing out that the father is traditionally described as a business failure. And this is based on one document by and large, which was a promissory note where he said, I owe somebody some money. The promissory notes were very common. That's the way they traded, you know, in a barter-like uh, economy in the 18th century and the, in the 1740s and the 1750s. What really did his father in, I think the evidence shows, uh, was this plague upon their houses in terms of uh, a diphtheria epidemic that swept through New England. 
uh, and it uh, it actually led to the death of three of Arnold's siblings, uh, two young girls and a boy. Uh, it left only Arnold and his sister, and the father almost died during this plague. And it's like the father had his family, his very, and, he, and the father was basically a successful businessman at this point in time. They lived in a very nice home. Uh, they were well respected in the community, but the loss of the family just tore them apart. This is my interpretation. And it is such a, it's really such a sad story because uh, what happens is the father then turns to drink, I guess we can say. Uh, he becomes an alcoholic. He's, he's in grieving. It's a way he's trying to uh, deal with the grief of the loss of, of his children. And so it really becomes the, the son's duty and responsibility to get, get over his cowardly manner, uh, referring to uh, the son in this case. And uh, it, it really is the challenge that Benedict, uh, our subject, has to deal with and he has to overcome. And the good break for him comes really through his mother. Uh, mother's name is Hannah. Uh, she has um, cousins, the Lathrop brothers. They're uh, business people, apothecaries uh, in the hometown of uh, Norwich. And they will take over and help train Arnold up. And Arnold takes full advantage of that training uh, because, as Tom just said, he's a very entrepreneurial guy. Uh, and he is oriented toward success. His father sort of restoring the, 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 the damaged reputation of the family through the father becoming an alcoholic and an embarrassment in the community. Uh, and this all then plays in uh, to the uh, matter of Arnold saying, I must overcome, I must stand tall, I must, I must indeed uh, become the very fine, respected representative of what had once been a very honored New England family. After all, he had a great, what is it, four generations back. Uh, there's five, I guess, if I think about it. Uh, four or five generations back, uh, his forebear was the governor of New England in the 17th century. I mean, so this was, not the governor of New England, I'm sorry, the governor of Rhode Island. You don't get to be governor of New England. That's a different, different subject. Uh, so this is really what he's all about, driving forward, and doing everything he can to become uh, a successful, worthy, respected citizen, making good contributions to society. Could we talk about Arnold's service during the Seven Years' War? It was such a pivotal moment for so many people involved in the revolutionary story. Uh, yes, I can do that very quickly. Uh, his service is almost none. Um, there again, there's the, the story about Arnold because there is a namesake uh, who apparently kept joining militia companies during the Seven Years' War, and then he grabbed the bounty money, and then he'd flee back to Connecticut. But it's a it's really been shown, I think, very, very successfully that that isn't our Benedict Arnold. Our Benedict Arnold, uh, if I can go to the year 1757, he was 16 years old. Uh, and if, you, if we, we all recall that that point in time, Montcalm and uh, uh, various Indians came out of Canada and overran and destroyed Fort William Henry, and there was a massacre there uh, in the summer of 1757. And at that point, New England militia up and down uh, uh, through the various colonies uh, mobilized themselves, and Arnold was part of a group that mobilized in this point at the age of 16, and he was actually on active duty. They started to march north uh, uh, toward uh, the remains of Fort William Henry, but after about two weeks, they turned around and came back because Montcalm had pulled back north up to the Fort Ticonderoga area and beyond. So actually, one of the important points about Arnold I would like to make right now is he didn't have much military experience, but he's going to gain a lot of experience in managing folks when he gets into the mercantile business, uh, and he will take those lessons in dealing as a leader in the uh, sea, he will become then an individual who will become a most successful leader uh, of of men uh, in in combat. So it's it's a very very interesting story because he basically had no military experience. He didn't get to go to West Point. <laughs> there was no West Point. <laughs> he just was as I as I wrote one article. Uh, he was a natural-born military genius, if I could put it that way. 
What drew Arnold to the Patriot cause? Well, what we bring forth in uh, the film is his sense of idealism, that he's motivated to join the Patriot cause because of the promise of an egalitarian society where people will be rewarded for their accomplishments, not for their uh, privileged birthright in an aristocratic society. Um, so he's drawn to those ideals. He may be imagining that um, it's as idealistic as uh, he, he wishes it to be, but uh, that's what's motivating him. He, he's this, this guy who has lifted himself up by his bootstraps. He's become very successful, but he's still not really recognized or accepted into society. Um, so he, he's joining uh, the cause in the hope that there could be a new republic where people are treated differently. And let me add, um, Arnold, as an individual, has a very difficult time in his own mind with what he <clears throat> will perceive as very power. Very, very important in understanding him. You can take him back to the time uh, when his siblings were dying uh, during the diphtheria epidemic in the uh, early 1750s. And he's losing his siblings and mom is, in, and Arnold is off at a, a, a primary school and mom's writing him letters saying, prepare yourself. A guy can strike you dead as easily as he has struck your uh, sisters and brother dead, that sort of thing. And, and it's very, very important because then he comes back and then he sees how arbitrary the community is toward him because of his father's difficulties. And he doesn't like that. And really one of the themes that will emerge from him and go, go as we look at his life, as he lived it, um, uh, is this matter of dealing with arbitrary power. In the 1760s and the 1770s, he it becomes an apothecary merchant. And then he's, he's a merchant at sea. That is, he's trading down to the West Indies and all the way up into Canada uh, managing and captaining his own vessels and that sort of thing. And he doesn't like all the restrictions the British are putting on uh, commercial activity in the empire. Uh, and that sort of thing, he, he actually speaks and writes about the Boston Massacre and says, what is this? Why are we standing up? This is arbitrary power. They're killing our own citizens. And, and uh, these are just examples that I, uh, I can give you because ultimately the irony in the story is he will begin to perceive leaders in Congress and local leaders, uh, local individuals that he has to work with once he is becomes this very talented military leader for the revolution. He begins to perceive them also in the context of arbitrary power. And that's going to affect his decision making. And we'll deal with that more as we go along. What is it do you think that made him such an admirable leader during the war? Um, he's very. Uh, I'll start briefly by saying uh, he's very brave. Um, he leads from the front, not from behind, and uh, uh, his men love him, and he loves his men. Uh, there's a there's a real bond of uh, respect between them. Uh, so he, he's, but he's a military genius, a uh, a native genius uh, on military affairs and uh, really proves himself uh, again and again. Let me add that, that Arnold sees the big picture in 1775. And he understands that if the British cut off the New England colonies uh, from the others, that is use the Hudson River Champlain Corridor from New York, uh, New York City all the way north up to Montreal, uh, that this could divide the cause. And if the British knock out New England, which is the center, the origin of the rebellion, at the center of it, um, that this can end everything. And so one of his talents is he sees the big picture and he'll write about that. And he will advise, actually, he'll advise the Continental Congress after his activity and going to uh, uh, take Fort Ticonderoga in May of 1775. And uh, he says, I want to get involved in this because I can see this. And this, these are the things that we, we've got to do if we're going to win this war. So he's a big picture guy on one level. But when you get down to 
the more operational uh, and then the uh, tactical level uh, involved in combat. As, as Tom said, he has no fear. This is a man of courage. He isn't afraid to lead out front. It's like, okay, if I get killed, I get killed. But if I seriously wounded, I'm, and he was seriously wounded, as we know, twice, um, I am willing to do it because I am not going to be one of those individuals who's going to turn, turn coat and run. I'm going to do everything I can to stand and to fight uh, and to fight for everything, for the love of my own family uh, and for uh, serving the cause, which he then believes in very wholeheartedly, the cause of American liberty. And that if individuals won't stand, and by the way, let me add, he has a thing and develops it about the civilian population and about the Continental Congress and lack of support for, for the forces that he is involved with in the invasion of Canada in 75 and 76. And that is one of those early triggering factors where he begins in his enthusiasm to dive a little bit, uh, the veracity of the cause. Talk about some of the highlights of Arnold's service as a patriot. Of course, the documentary does this in great detail. What could you share with us today? Well, sure. Um, the uh, the key uh, to understand the context here is, as Jim's pointed out, uh, this is all happening in the northern campaign. This is happening in that corridor between Montreal and New York, the Hudson River Valley and the Champlain uh, Valley. And in successive years, he captures Fort Ticonderoga. Um, in uh, a, uh, a bloodless uh, taking of the fort along with uh, Ethan Allen. And then he's marching through the main wilderness to, uh, on the orders of uh, General Washington to take the city of Quebec and help turn the, uh, Canada into the, uh, to the American cause and join our, our uh, rebellion. It, it's a heroic journey across uncharted territory through the main wilderness. And at the walls of Quebec, he lays siege to that fortress city. In a blinding snowstorm, his, uh, his men, his small band of men, uh, attack this huge fort and he's wounded. And when he's taken back behind the lines, with this uh, a, a very bad wound to his leg, he's uh, laying in bed with uh, guns at his side and swords at his side, ready to take on any uh, British who come uh, come looking for him. It's uh, it's a, an amazing moment, and we we have it in the film. We show it in the film, and the Battle of Valcour Island uh, on Lake Champlain in 1776, um, spring of 1776, uh, it, it, I mean the fall, uh, he's very um, uh, uh, naval, uh, he shows naval genius, and it's a huge uh, co uh, conflagration uh, with huge ships that the British have uh, taken apart piece by piece and brought overland to the lake. Um, the odds are enormous against him, and he's he and his men are using uh, brilliant uh, strategies and sneaking around in the dark. And over a period of many days, fight this British armada to a standstill. That the whole Valcour Lake Champlain battles never been presented in film before. It's always overlooked, and uh, for the first time, we really do it justice. Um, a good 20 minutes of our uh, two-hour documentary uh, goes into that uh, uh, really untold uh, story of uh, this great naval battle on, on Valcour Island, uh, or in and around Valcour Island. And, uh, of course, the Battle of Saratoga in 1777, we really do uh, a very big treatment of that. That's where we have our largest number of reenactors. We have 2,000 reenactors working with us to recreate those uh, huge, that, uh, huge battle scene uh, at Saratoga, where Arnold, uh, in, in 
disobeying orders, disobeying General Gates' orders, um, uh, has a leads a charge and uh, captures the British Army. It, it, truly, the a turning point of the war, uh, and uh, good things really start to happen after that. So we're telling stories, showing stories that um, are exciting to watch and enlightening to uh, hear about sometimes for the first time. Well, what I'd like to add is that Arnold is spectacular in combat. I mean, it, it's just it's just beyond belief. I'll give you two examples. During that retreat, actually, you're going up Lake Champlain, you're going toward Fort Ticonderoga. This is after the Valcor battle. Arnold will take on in one sequence in the two hour battle, his vessel alone, four or five of those far superior British vessels, and he duels them for two hours. And he is out dueling these men who are in these crews that are the top, the top folks out there, the best trained in the world uh, in military, you know, naval combat. And he actually is able to escape from this situation. That's raw courage in play. A second example of this raw courage in play is when he does come out uh, in the second Saratoga battle uh, and he will lead the charge back into the British lines. And in this in incredible scene, at one point, his force is moving forward. The British are behind uh, a redoubt set up and this is before he rides in and gets shot up the second time. And he will ride between the two lines that are firing at each other, stimulating his men to press forward, to press forward, to press forward. It is amazing. That kind of, he would have won two men of honors alone if we had such a thing, just with those two instances. And it, it's, it again, it's, it's what makes him this, uh, we call him an action hero uh, in this sense, uh, he was doing everything possible, and he actually, by these actions, in both first delaying the British and then getting involved in the Saratoga campaign, he will actually help the stage to bring the French in. And once the French come in on the American uh, side in 1778, uh, the Brits are going to have a very hard time, as we know, and we know the ending of they, they have a very hard time winning the war. They lose it. How did the politics of military service begin to alter Arnold's perception of the war? Was he simply ill-suited for playing that political game? Well, he first of all begins in 1776, during the, during the time of the uh, uh, Valcor campaign. In that fall, uh, his non-friends, of which there are individuals like Horatio Gates and uh, this character John Brown from Massachusetts, and uh, they're writing bad things about him. They appear at Congress and Arnold actually gets a letter. He's out there, you know, on the lake trying to defend uh, the advance of the British. And he's getting letters from a, a delegate in Congress who said, your best friends aren't your countrymen. Well, what would you think if you got a letter like that? What's going on here? I'm trying to win this war. I'm trying to find ways to defeat the British. And what's happening is I'm being criticized behind my back. Uh, and that's one kind of an example. And then uh, you can you can move into 1777, where he is passed over in February 1777, even though he's the number one brigadier in terms of rank and seniority, he is passed over and five others are promoted over him to be uh, major generals. And Arnold basically says this, this is a total attack on my honor. This is a total attack on my re uh, reputation. This is just arbitrary power, and I'm now the victim of it. And he will actually go to Philadelphia and try to defend himself unsuccessfully, I might add, because he doesn't get much sympathy from leaders in Congress uh, who have been told a lot of bad stories about him, both of which are not really true, just uh, petty, petty politics. Arnold had a hard time with petty politics, if I could put it that way. And our revolution, of, we don't talk like to talk about it very much, but are actually filled with petty politics. And he actually becomes, in a certain way, one of the victims. You know, and I would add um, to that, his experience as the uh, military commander of uh, the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the British uh, had occupied Philadelphia and then evacuated 
um, of their own choice, uh, leaving that city in a, a, a state of utter chaos. Uh, it had been a divided city in terms of uh, loyalists and patriots and, and neutrals, about in equal thirds. And when the British pulled out, the loyalists were uh, going hammer and tong against the uh, perceived uh, loyalists. They were hanging them high from the trees and the lampposts and uh, burning their homes or uh, confiscating their property. And it was a reign of terror. And into that situation, Benedict Arnold take, uh, is, is ordered by Washington to bring uh, uh, some peace and some law and order to that city. And Arnold is experiencing or getting a foreshadowing of what might happen if this revolution really succeeds. Is, it, is the whole country going to be plunged into this kind of chaos? And I think that's a big part of what starts to uh, open his eyes to the kind of revolution he may have signed up for. It's not going to be uh, the idealistic uh, uh, shining city on the hill that he signed up for. It could be a bloodbath. Um, so that's part of it, too. Could you talk about his decision to ultimately aid the British cause? There, there are a series of steps in this process. It's, it's long in coming. It isn't that Arnold just woke up one day and said, that's it, I'm going over to the British. Uh, it, it really begins, and I've given you a little bit of information about some of his self-doubt about the cause, which really does start in 1776. And then it slides downward in 1777 in the whole uh, controversy over his promotion. Uh, he finally is promoted. Uh, then there's a debate about, it's, it's very insulting whether he will go and become a senior of those who were promoted over him. Uh, finally, that happens. And that happens as a result of the great fighting that he demonstrated at Saratoga. And I might add, unlike Horatio Gates, who was never near the battles, um, who was declared by Congress with the medal, the hero of Saratoga, that had to hurt Arnold. Arnold's writhing in a hospital. He's, he's virtually lost one leg, destroyed uh, in the magnificent charge into Balcarres's redoubt. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, the, 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 point, the point is that his attitude is going downhill, and it's really a matter of increasing disillusionment. It starts to become embitterment to the point in 1778 where he writes when Washington tells him, we have re restored your full promotion. You're now a senior major general. Ryan, Arnold writes back to Washington and says, well, not exactly thank you, but I want to wish you well, and he repeats this, with your activity and your cause. He doesn't say I, my cause. He doesn't say our cause. He's beginning mentally to separate himself from that. And then all the turmoil in Philadelphia when Wa Washington says, you, I can't really put you in combat because you're not well enough to even ride on a horse uh, very well. Uh, uh, he puts him in charge of the trying to straighten out conditions in Philadelphia. And then basically for him, all heck will break loose, uh, and he gets into arguments with the Joseph Reeds of the world who wanted to punish uh, those who cooperated with the British, and um, he falls in love with Peggy Shippen, and then there's all of these stories about Peggy wooed him over to the British, and that's, you know, semi-nonsense. Uh, the evidence doesn't support that stuff very well, but the point is it's a downhill process, and finally the point will come where he says, given everything, given everything that I've contributed, short of life itself, I've supported this cause, I have supported it financially, I have given to this cause, I am, my, my body has been almost destroyed by this cause, I'm limping everywhere, uh, I'm uncomfortable, I'm in terrible pain, and then what do we have? We have this arbitrary power, we have the Continental Congress that won't settle its accounts with him, uh, we have all this, this berating of him by the Joseph Reed types in, in Philadelphia, and that's it. And finally, he's just going to say, I'm, gonna, I'm really doubting this, and maybe we've made a colossal mistake. Maybe to go back to what we talked about at the beginning, my idealism was we could create a better world here, a fairer world, one in which wasn't 
you, you, you were actually recognized because of your talent and your merit, but rather what we have is another system which is just as corrupt in its own way. Uh, and it's not serving those who have really, like me, who have really served the cause. Uh, and therefore, I will see what I can do. As I once called him, he's a Pied Piper in trying to get Americans to realize they've made, and, then, and I think he's wrong, but they've made a horrible mistake in getting involved in trying to challenge British authority. They should go back and accept the world that they once to have and just to negotiate a better deal for themselves, which they failed to do back in 74 and 75. So that, that's really, I think, part of the pattern. Let me just say it traditionally. The three traditions are money made him do it, Peggy made him do it, the devil made him do it. And that is all backward looking information that doesn't deal with the reality, the day to day realities as he lived his life. Uh, you know, today we're not going to buy the devil thing, but there's still a lot of people that believe it was all about money. But I would argue if you really put the books out there, you'll find Arnold didn't gain very much financially from this particular move. And he knew he was taking a risk, but he thought he was doing the right thing. And from our perspective, obviously, he did the wrong thing. Uh, but uh, again, this is a matter of trying to understand rather than just write another condemnation, condemnation if I could put it that way. I would underline the... Um point that Arnold felt like he was doing the right thing. Um, uh, he, he didn't think of it as a, a, a treason. Uh, in fact, you have to re remember that the, rebel the rebels were uh, the traitors at this time. There was no country. There was no constitution. There was no um, uh, a nation to be loyal to. In fact, everybody was in uh, 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 the revolutionaries were in uh, rebellion against the king. And Arnold was returning his loyalty to the king. Uh, so uh, technically, you really can't be looking at him as, as a traitor. But our film uh, is designed to kind of show this through Arnold's point of view. And as events unfold, and as you're seeing things the way Arnold saw them, the way we're presenting them, you, we hope the audience, we feel the audience does, come to the same conclusion that if they were in Arnold's shoes, they would do what he did. Um, this is the first film uh, that I'm aware of that actually takes Arnold's point of view and tells the story through his eyes. Um, and he's coming to, to becoming the question, uh, uh, is this really the best thing for my countrymen? And uh, he concludes that a swift end um, would be better for all concerned. How effective was Arnold in the service of the crown? It's a mixed bag, let me put it that way. Um, <laughs> twice Arnold served the British before uh, bowing out of the war and actually going back to England and then up into Canada uh, in 1781, 1782. Uh, one was an invasion of Virginia in January 1781. Uh, this involved uh, depends how one wants to interpret the uh, uh, stacking of uh, of uh, the the area along the the Dame, James River all the way up to Richmond. Uh, and Mark Lender and I wrote an article about this. Uh, and our argument was that Arnold was not destroying as much as been traditionally alleged, because that's the traditional art. He's a destroyer. He's not uh, anything else. And uh, uh, that our point is, is that what he really was trying to do, and he did spend a lot of time on this, was to convince individuals and some of the leaders in the area to give it up. I've given it up. You need to give it up. Let's go back to the British and get things squared up. Then the second time the service comes in September of 1781, uh, and from the point of view of individuals in New London, uh, Connecticut, involved Fort Griswold and so on and so forth, Arnold was unmerciful. He was paying them back because he hadn't been treated well. Um, then if you look at it, and again, from a military point of view, New London was a center of privateering activity having a devastating impact. Privateers running out uh, you know, of, of New London and attacking British vessels, bringing goods to support British forces in America. That's a whole logistical story. Uh, and 
So the question really becomes, as we framed it in a journal of the military history article, was, was New London a legitimate military target? And people would say, well, no, uh, they're civilians, and you're not supposed to be attacking civilians. But those civilians were actually not just civilians. Many of them were involved in the privateering activity and, and uh, very effectively harming British supply lines. And so Arnold's assignment from a military point of view does have some military significance, although it didn't change much of anything, uh, because as we know, the really big engagement was going on uh, south in Virginia and Yorktown, and that's the one that really scored uh, in the long run. Arnold will go back. We'll try to serve in British forces. Uh, the Brits don't know what to do with him. He's an embarrassment uh, to them. Uh, they have uh, the situation about the death of John Andre, like Andre was this helpless victim and uh, was unmercifully killed by the rebels, and that was all Arnold's fault, and that's a story we don't have time to get into. But I would say, generally speaking, uh, his success as a British commander was mixed. Um, probably in the end, if we look at it in terms of the broader significance of the whole war, not terribly significant. How do you feel this film helps us understand the Revolutionary Era better? I'll start and uh, say that for me, it shows that we've been a divided country from the very start. Um, that uh, there is a, a third who wanted things to say the same, um, the loyalists, a third who were re the rebels and wanted change, and another third who were kind of in the middle and just waiting to see how things turned out. And our, our nation's always been uh, kind of in one of those three buckets. Uh, so I think that helps us um, understand the cauldron of our of the birth of a nation and where our history has taken us over these years. Also, we better understand the Northern campaign of the revolution by seeing this film. The, the, uh, the Northern campaign, that Hudson Valley, Lake Champlain corridor story is not told. Uh, it's not well understood. And this film helps us understand that aspect of the revolutionary era better. Um, in our film, we talk about the contribution of women and blacks, um, which is a deep, helps deepen our understanding of the revolutionary era. Okay, let me um, make a couple of other points along this same line. Uh, I think it really does deepen and enrich the story because it makes the story much more realistic than it's traditionally been presented. Now, let me go back to my fourth grade education. It was good versus evil. That's what it was all about. Uh, it really was never that. It, it really was never that simple. It was much more complex. And one of the things that I have found as a research historian is how much, if you just take the American society, bickering and pettiness was going on. And rising out of that bickering and pettiness was what a guy like Arnold was trying to do. Uh, Washington had to do the same all the time. Just study George Washington, all the nonsense he had to put up with over and over again. And somehow, we don't really want that story. We want this to be much more purified, if I might say even sanctified, that it's that it's this glorious moment when these people rose above, they joined they joined together as one and they fought valiantly for eight long years uh, to bring about uh, the American experiment and the American Republic. But the real story is not like that. The real story is about real people, uh, people who couldn't get along, uh, I, I could name, and I've tried to avoid that, you know, some of the pettiest people in this revolution were individuals in the long run, like Horatio Gates and this guy, John Brown from New York, who somehow is a local hero up there. Uh, and uh, I know Brown has his defenders and that sort of thing. And, and he, what they did was they, these kinds of people made it very, very difficult to be to be an Arnold, to be a real hero, to, hero, to be a real contributor. It's that nitty gritty that is so important to understand the real revolution. And uh, 
Uh, this is in addition to everything else. Uh, I think uh, just, just to emphasize one more point that Tom has already made, to understand the importance of the Northern campaign, the whole war uh, did not actually resonate around George Washington. And I'm a great admirer of Washington. I mean, in many ways, he's my favorite or hero of the, uh, of the whole story. But what is important to understand, there were other individuals out there, there were other theaters of action. Uh, David McCullough in his book, 1776, uh, for instance, you only learned about Washington. There was no Northern campaign. The Northern campaign in 1776 and the activity into 1777 made all the difference in the world because out of that Northern campaign, out of the battles uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the Saratoga campaign, the French will ultimately turn the weight toward the colonists by joining them and giving them so many resources that they did not have or they were unwilling to use uh, in making it possible uh, to defeat the British and bring about American victory. And that's a very important part of the story. And amazingly enough and ironically, who is at the center of that? There's no more important general in the Northern campaign than Benedict Arnold. There's no one even close from that point of view. I like Philip Scholar a lot. I think he's been very misrepresented, but some of the others really didn't have very much to offer. But uh, there you go. Here's this guy. Ironically for him, he destroyed his reputation. But in the process and all the things that he went through, he actually helped bring about a great American victory. And I would also say a great nation in the process. Irony, indeed. It's an amazing story, and I would encourage everyone to get involved in it. Thomas Mercer and James Kirby Martin, thank you both for being here again. Hey, uh, Brady, I would like sure. to uh, close by saying that people can find this film, and, and I really hope that uh, they get a chance to watch it, on Prime Video, uh, on iTunes, on Amazon. If you're not a member of Prime, you can find it on Amazon. It's on Vudu. It's on Roku. Um, if you have a smart TV, you can use the search function. It'll probably find it in one of those places. And we have a website where we keep updating the list of places where you can see it. And our website is BenedictArnoldHeroBetrayed.com. BenedictArnoldHeroBetrayed.com. The music played in this episode included works by Kevin McLeod and the Sturbridge Colonial Militia. Any unauthorized reproduction or use of this podcast, without the express written permission of the Journal of the American Revolution, is strictly prohibited. For everyone here at Dispatches, I'm Brady Kreitzer saying so long.